Erica. Uh, next, Erica Frank, who is the Director of Education and Interpretation at Philoli, will discuss how training by the International Coalition for Sites of Conscience and Philoli's focus on diversity, equity, and accessibility and, and inclusion has shaped how the organization connects with the community and infuses new perspectives into Philoli's storytelling. She will be followed by Stacey Montooth, Executive Director of the State of Nevada Indian Commission, and Bobby Rader, Museum Director of the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center and Museum in Carson City, Nevada, who will discuss how the museum is centering Indigenous voices in its interpretation and programming. The Stewart Indian School Cultural Center and Museum is dedicated to the memories of the first Stewart students from the Great Basin Tribes in 1890 and all students and their families who are impacted by the Stewart experience. Harriet Brady, who attended the Stewart Indian School, will be available to answer questions following the presentation. So, as defined by the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, a site of conscience is a place of memory, such as a historic site, place-based museum or memorial, that prevents this erasure from happening in order to ensure a more just and humane future. These sites provide space spaces to remember and preserve even the most traumatic memories and enable their visitors to make connections between the past and related contemporary human rights issues. And I was somewhat familiar with Sites of Conscience when I first started organizing this webinar, but the more I learned about it, the framework seems highly relevant to the current discussion in the preservation field as we shift toward a more people-centered movement. We're all grappling with how to identify and interpret places in a way that is relevant to the public and connects place-based history with current discussions on racism and discrimination, environmental justice, indigenous rights, and many others. The International Coalition for Sites of Conscience was founded in 1999. It currently includes 300 member members in 65 countries. These members and partners remember a wide array of histories and come from a wide range of settings that are all united by their commitment to connect the past to present, memory to action. Member organizations receive assistance through grants, networking, training, and advocacy. And I'm gonna briefly hi highlight the 15 member sites in California, and you'll see a mix of contemporary organizations such as the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, which is dedicated to understanding the Holocaust in both historic and contemporary settings and confronting all forms of prejudice and discrimination. And you'll also see more familiar historic sites such as Angel Island Immigration Station and other sites managed by the National Park Service. Bailoli joined in 2019, which Erica Frank will discuss in more detail in her presentation. And both Philoli, with its exquisite early 20th century Georgian revival architecture and formal gardens, and the Stewart Indian School, which may be the only intact school built by students, are recognized using traditional preservation tools, including listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Yet, as you see, you'll see in the presentations that follow, both sites seek to center the people historically associated with their properties, including the diverse staff and landscape professionals who help shape Philoli and the students who attended the Stewart Indian School. Alumni and their families helped create and design the museum that opened in early 2020. And both sites also seek to engage visitors and the broader community in profound and meaningful ways, which you'll see in the presentations that follow. And with that, I'll hand things over to Erica. Thank you. Okay, hello there. Thanks, Erica. So I would like to talk with you today, um, give a brief overview of Philoli, and also talk about how the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience has helped us um, incorporate diverse perspectives into our storytelling and how we interpret Philoli. Nope. Having a little problem getting my screen to advance. There we go. Um, so first, I just would like to acknowledge that Filoli is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatu Shaloni people, who were the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. Here you can see Filoli situated um, in this beautiful watershed area of the Santa Cruz Mountains. We're about 30 miles south of San Francisco, 
and we're on um, 654 acres uh, surrounded by thousands of acres of protected land. And that watershed is one of the things that made this such a desirable place to be, um, both for the Rematouche Ohlone, for the Mexican ranchos, um, and even for the loggers in the gold rush era who were using the watershed and the creeks to uh, get their trees downstream to Redwood City, which is um, adjacent to Woodside. Uh, in the early 1900s, Filoli was listed for sale with the idea that it could be a housing development. Um, fortunately, it was purchased by Agnes and William Bourne in 1915. And then they built their home, which was for them a retirement home. Um, Filoli has a 56 room historic house, a 16 acre beautiful formal garden, an agricultural field where the Ross and the Bournes um, had sheep and horses. We have hundreds of heritage orchard trees or heritage fruit trees in our orchards. Uh, and we also have a nature preserve where visitors can hike and just experience the beautiful um, watershed lands. People ask, where does the name Filoli come from? Well, William Bourne dubbed it Filoli, which is actually a made up word. Uh, here's his motto, fight for a just cause, love your fellow man and live a good life. And you can see where fight, love, lives come from and that became Filoli. Here are William and Agnes Bourne. Again, they built Filoli as a retirement home and William uh, made lots of money in um, gold. He owned a gold mine. He also was a very smart investor and invested in um, what became PG&E and as well as um, water. The Bournes passed away in 1936 and the Roth family purchased Filoli. Uh, here is uh, Laureline and Bill Ross and their children. Um, they moved into Filoli with two teenage daughters and an adult son. And the Ross money came from Matson Shipping Company, um, where Bill was the president and Laureline's father was also the president prior to Bill. Well, the Bournes were known for um, developing Filoli and building Filoli. The Ross were known um, for developing the garden and also continuing the tradition of flowers in the house and bringing the garden indoors. They're also known for throwing big lavish parties. Um, you can see one great example of, of Laureline's love of both florals and um, throwing parties for a ball for her uh, granddaughter. She had these sunflowers grown in the field and then moved inside for the party decor. We also uh, want to highlight the staff at Filoli who really built a community here um, in addition to helping care for the property and the families. Uh, at the height of the Bourne era, as many as 35 members cared for the estate um, and many of them immigrated from Europe and Japan and China. Uh, in more modern times, a dynasty was uh, filmed at Filoli and I'll talk a little more about this later. Um, but it's the 40th anniversary of Dynasty this year, so we are definitely celebrating that. Um, the pilot episodes were filmed here, and here uh, Crystal Carrington is getting married in Filoli's ballroom. In 1975, Laureline Roth donated Filoli to the National Trust for His Historic Preservation. She felt Filoli was too beautiful to be public or to be private, so she wanted it to be a public place. Um, in the last year and a half during COVID, it has been just a respite for our community. Um, visitors can come be outdoors with family and feel safe in a beautiful place. And we just feel really fortunate that this has been available during this time. Currently, our mission is to connect our rich history with a vibrant future through beauty, nature, and shared stories. And shared stories is where we can really connect to the mission of the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience and also to our work in diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. Um, Filoli has a DAI statement, which is on our website, um, but 
just as important as the statement is our action plan. We have a policy and we have an action plan to ensure that that uh, work actually gets done. It's a continuous effort and it's not just making a statement for us. Um, the thing that really speaks to me here is that we are open to all and work tirelessly and collaboratively to create a place that welcomes and respects everyone. And that collaboration for us, a lot of that is working with partners in our community. Um, the International Coalition has helped us learn how to work with partners. Um, we have been really fortunate to participate in a grant that um, is a year and a half long program um, and training. And the purpose of the grant is to address community needs uh, as a result of COVID. Um, and the goal here was to create access to Philoli to promote healing and social cohesion and community resilience. Um, and again, uh, we're being trained to work with community partners and one really the most important thing about these partnerships is that we might have ideas around um, how we think partners can interact with the space and how their community can interact with our space. Uh, but we need to start with what the community needs. And so while we may be reaching out to partners uh, with ideas, the conversation is really around what do you need from us? Um, what do your members need from us? And that's really our focus. So we decided to work on a preschool program. We have two preschools that we're working with. And the idea is that they really um, have a holistic approach to working with the children and families where they're supporting the families. It's not just a daycare center where um, the, the families drop the kids off and pick them up at the end of the day. Um, so we'll be doing three trips with the children. They're uh, actually starting this Friday. We're really excited to have dozens of kids engaging with the space. Uh, and then their families come also and uh, we think it's really important for them to have access to Philoli year round. So they'll all be receiving memberships so they can come uh, as a family when they're not just coming for the field trips. Um, the grant will provide training for the staff as well as transportation and fund those memberships. And for us, the goal is for the children to have experiences outside the home um, with each other and with their families, but also for them to feel comfortable seeking out nature and gardens as a place for respite and creative expression and social connections. Another thing that Sites of Conscience has helped us do is to recognize the lived experiences of marginalized communities and BIPOC visitors and how they view our historic property. Um, they've also helped us to feel safe having hard conversations and not necessarily comfortable, and we're still working on that, um, but definitely to feel safe and to help our visitors feel safe having these conversations. Um, here's one example. Um, one way that we can sort of start the conversations uh, is by highlighting when Philoli has been a backdrop to these discussions. Um, so here on this banner is a scene from Dynasty, which is set in Philoli's library, where Blake Carrington comes out to his father. And it's the first time a primetime television show featured a gay character. So um, we really feel it's important to point that out as visitors are walking through these spaces. Again, um, acknowledging and recognizing uh, the lived experiences of all of us and how that also affects our relationship to the land and to the buildings at Philoli and also to art. Um, here is a mezzotint, which is in Philoli's drying room. We have about 40 mezzotints in there and they feature garden scenes with families and um, these two people who are in love. And we think it's really important to feature images, um, for example, of these two women in love getting married at Philoli. So um, we want to recognize the different lived experiences and how Philoli and a lot of museums um, have really um, gone towards those white hetero norms. And so we're trying to infuse new perspectives into our own presentations. Uh, Philoli holds a pride event, a pride weekend every June. And um, this year we wanted to ask what our visitors are proud of. 
Um, I love here how this parent um, shared their pride in the movement, but also in their son and his husband. Um, we think that inclusive storytelling also includes capturing a breadth of experiences uh, and pride is one of the ways that we can do that. Uh, we also think it's important to maintain a connection to our mission and our traditions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the story of flowers at Philoli and bringing flowers in the garden indoors is really important to us and it's one of our traditions. And so during Pride, we had really incredible um, rainbow displays of flowers and those are created by Nigella, which is a floral design company with many queer identifying staff. And so they created these gorgeous arrangements for us. And again, um, incorporating new modern perspectives, but also um, connecting to Philoli's traditions. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we feel like this is an ongoing effort to ensure di diverse participants are valued as respected members of our organization. And for us, that also starts with our staff. Um, Pride was developed by our queer identifying staff and some even um, hosted our dynasty themed drag competition, which you see here. Exhibitions are another way that we work to include diverse perspectives. Nest Creating Home is an exhibition that um, was in 2018, and we use it as an opportunity to talk about the uh, historic staff and where they immigrated and migrated from and the work that they did in the house. And um, we also worked with an artist, Sarah Friedlander, who did photography and um, these gorgeous three-dimensional pieces that were inspired by her own family story as Jewish immigrants. Uh, we also asked that our own visitors gave their voices to the exhibition. So hanging in the house, um, we asked them to uh, tell their stories on these luggage tags and we got just the most wonderful variety of stories. And also visitors reminded us that not all of them um, came and immigrated to the United States. Some were here, uh, this Native American story, and were displaced, and others were brought here as enslaved peoples. So uh, it was really important to make sure that we were uh, including all the stories, whether folks came here uh, as they wanted to or came here as enslaved people. Some interesting uh, ideas that came out of NEST was that we had really tended to see the historic staff in one dimension. And some of them, for example, the Chinese chef immigrated to the United States during the Chinese Exclusion Act. And there were some hardships through immigration, um, hard, hardships through racism. Uh, the Japanese butler was interned during his time working at Philoli. So we wanted to share those stories of resilience. Um, we also wanted to respond to visitor inquiries about the lack of diversity in historic photos. Uh, there were no Black or Latino staff or performers here at Philoli. So uh, one of the things we did in our grand ballroom we put it, the music of Duke Ellington in there, um, who was uh, really well known at the time the Bournes were listening to symphony and opera. And so we wanted to infuse the space with his music and his voice. I also wanna point out that this isn't about removing the stories of the Bournes or the Ross, it's about adding new layers, about adding the diverse stories and different narratives on top of the narratives that we're already telling. Another exhibition that we did um, in 2020 was Rich Soil. Uh, artist Christine Mays did these really wonderful, really moving wire sculptures and presenting the artist's perspective, infusing that into the garden was really important for us. Uh, her work was inspired by Al Alvin Ailey's dance composition, Revelations. And I think what really spoke to visitors was um, her view that this was hard metal wire and that showed resilience and perseverance. Uh, and that was something that we really needed in 2020. 
We also want to use our existing collection and make connections to that. We have a lot of really wonderful pieces of Asian art, especially art porcelain. And the plant collection was uh, really inspired and developed by Toichi Demoto, who worked with the Roth family. Uh, he was a nursery man who um, helped bring camellias and wisteria, among other plants, to the United States. And one of the reasons that you see these wonderful plants at Filoli and also throughout our region. It's also really important that we include um, the next generation of the, the people who are be, will be doing our work, um, the museum professionals, the preservationists. Uh, we had a really wonderful story done by two young women at a high school um, for their paper. It was a multimedia story. And I wanna recommend, um, write this down so you can Google it later. It's Verde Magazine, just Google Verde Magazine Filoli and you can see their story. And it's a great overview of stories of resilience. Um, but also, again, this is an extremely important topic for this generation and we need to continue the conversation and include them in the conversation and the work that we're doing. And lastly, I just wanna to touch on um, inclusion and preservation. You can see here a photo during the Bourne era, which is this gorgeous vegetable garden um, that when Philoli became public was never opened to the public. Um, it's currently used to grow vegetables in the staff's downtime and they harvested, it's basically a community garden for us. And here in yellow, you can see this pretty sizable um, plot that we have not made public. Um, so we're really excited. We're actually going to renovate this space and open it next year. And it's going to be a vegetable garden that we're reimagining as a public space that's a resource for gardening information, for our own gardens and for stories about many food, food cultures. And that's really the most important piece of this to us. Um, it's a really wonderful way to incorporate both uh, past stories of food cultures and how um, we look at food now as a community and just celebrate all of our different food cultures in the Bay Area. Um, it's also going to be a place that feels physically accessible and um, we're really looking at how it can be more physically accessible um, as well as culturally relevant for everyone in the Bay Area and those who visit Filoli as well. So that's everything and I look forward to answering your questions when we're done. Thank you very much, Erica. That was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot more about Filoli than I knew, but uh, I just wanted to turn it uh, over to our next group of panelists, and I'm going to briefly introduce them by name, and they're welcome to talk more about themselves. But uh, coming up, we have Bobby Ratter, uh, Stacy Montooth, and Harriet uh, Brady, and I think Stacy will be presenting the slides. So Stacy, uh, feel free to introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Stacy Montooth. Good afternoon. My name is Stacy Montooth. I'm a citizen of the Walker River Paiute Nation, and I'm the executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission. One of my colleagues is um, online as well. She is Bobby Rader. She just actually stepped off screen. She definitely is camera shy. Bobby is our director of the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center and Museum. And I'm also joined by a longtime friend, um, an amazing educator, Miss Harriet Brady. She is a classroom teacher, and I will let her tell you some more about her adventures at uh, Pyramid Lake High School um, during the question and answer session. So before I get into my formal presentation, I need to carve out time to thank Jonathan, um, Erica Schultz, and of course your president, Cindy Heitzman. The Nevada Indian Commission and our Stewart Indian School Cultural Center Museum are thrilled to be a part of today's programming. Before I put together my, my remarks, I took a look at your website and it's so very impressive. Um, 
I instantly connected with some of the goals and, the, and of course, the mission statement of your organization. I love that as a group, you look for the most effective and enduring means for historic resources. I believe we do that here on our campus as well. The specific goal of your organization to, to make or to help your constituents make informed decisions. That is exactly what I try to do in the day-to-day -day operations of the Nevada Indians uh, Commission. So um, my, my last note here, um, to, I wanted to make sure that I, I mentioned, um, it is just this term that I continue to hear, side of consciousness. I am actually a degree journalist and as a wordsmith, I find that term so poetic and so powerful and hopefully soon prolific. So in advance, thank you all for your work. And um, I'm gonna share a little bit about the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center Museum with you. I look forward to any questions that you might have. So as your colleague did, um, we um, always want to acknowledge the land. We not only do that in our presentations, but when you visit our cultural center, and I am coming to you from the campus, which is just two miles from the state capitol here in Carson City, Nevada. So we always want to acknowledge the lands where I am talking to you, that is the traditional homelands of the Washoe or the Washishishu people um, in the Great Basin, the designated graphic area for um, our indigenous tribal groups that are now with in what is called the state of Nevada. We also have the Nui, the Numa, and um, the Nuwu. So we have Northern Paiute, Southern Paiute, and the Washoe people. All told, we have 27 tribal nations, bands, and colonies within the state of Nevada. Um, as you all probably know, we are talking about nations within the United States, nations within nations, and these are sovereign governments. In addition to the 27 tribal nations here in our area, throughout the country, there are ballpark 574 federally recognized tribal nations. The one absolute commonality that all of our tribal nations have is our connection to Mother Earth. We have different stories, we have different foods, we have different songs, different languages, dances. However, our core is our connection to Mother Earth. So we always want to acknowledge a sense of place. And when you visit the cultural center, that's exactly what you see, a, a, an amazing picture of the beautiful Sierra Nevada mountains. So for those of you that are um, civically engaged, which when I, again, looked at your website, it's clear that I'm speaking to a very um, sophisticated and highly intelligent audience. You all have probably seen not just the national, but the global headlines about what has been revealed in the residential boarding schools in Canada. So we want to take a little time to make sure that you all are aware here at the Stewart Indian School Cultural Center Museum. We too are processing this news, our alumni, our families, our communities. Um, honestly, for indigenous people, not just in this country, but around the world, the headlines are not that shocking. We knew, we knew all along that we had relatives, some as young as four, that didn't make it home. Um, what is difficult to deal with is that it is just now coming to the American consciousness. So as was mentioned in the remarks, the goal, the dedicated facility of our cultural center is to our alumni, to the first class that graduated from the Stewart Indian School. It's a place to heal. From the very beginning of the vision to churn what was a very dark, very difficult 
origin for the forced assimilation that took place. The leadership was absolutely determined that every aspect of our operation, from what it looked like, to who worked there, to the stories that were told, should all be ideas, suggestions from our alumni. So we have this amazing cultural advisory committee that has started from the very beginning of this vision, which started almost a decade ago, right to the grand opening, which took place last January. Just in case there are a few of you who don't know, um, the United States passed the Civilization Act, the Indian Civilization Act of 1890, and that reverberated um, here at Stewart through the, the 1980s. What took place was the United States adopted and implemented laws and policies that established Indian boarding schools. And Stewart is one of many across the nations. The purpose of the boarding school was to culturally assimilate my relatives. They would forcibly remove children from their families, sometimes physically ripping young children out of their mother's arms. And they were taken to distant residential facilities. These Native Americans, Alaska Natives, even Hawaiian Natives, they were stripped of their cultural identity, their language, their beliefs were suppressed. It was an absolute nightmare for our relatives. Again, Stewart Indian School is just one of many. There were 357 uh, boarding schools across the country. Many of you might know the very first Carlisle um, Institute in Pennsylvania was the flagship boarding school, if you will. This is a quick map um, that our friends at the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition put together. And this is a quick um, glimpse from the outside. From where I'm sitting, I can look across cross the quad and see this amazing building that has been restored. It's important to know that the school opened in 1890 as the forced assimilation model and it was closed in 1980. I graduated from high school in 1984. To me, that just seems like the other day. The school again was closed um, in the early 80s. And what happened was the federal government um, actually did a quick claim deed and the state of Nevada took over 110 acres of the campus. And the balance, the original campus was 240 acres. The balance went to the Washoe Nation, the Washishishu, who I mentioned earlier. They're in proximity, the closest uh, federally recognized tribe. And in fact, it, it was their land to begin with. So um, after the school was closed, there were different activities that took place out here. Um, even today, we have several state agencies that are housed out here in buildings that were actually built by our students. And um, in 2017 and 19, the Nevada leadership in the legislator, legislature agreed that um, the school was an absolute priority to be preserved and they allocated funding and the building that you're looking at used to be an administrative building and now houses our cultural center and museum. And it was um, jump started with funding allocated by our state government. Again, when you come into our amazing cultural center, the first thing you're gonna see is these beautiful Sierra Mountains. In our lobby, again, we acknowledge the traditional homelands of the Washu, Washo people, the Paiute and the Western Shoshone. Um, we incorporate our Great Basin language everywhere we can. And so when visitors come in, they're greeted with welcome or come in, and that is all in our respective Great Basin languages. Again, our main exhibit, we took the opportunity to um, 
explain the name of that um, amazing installation. It was in fact named by our alumni, that amazing cultural committee. And so we have um, our home, our relations spelled out here again in all four Great Basin languages. The main permanent exhibit um, in the back part of the building um, includes um, firsthand accounts from our alumni and our um, families. We use technology, including touch to, uh, touch pads, where you can hear the voices. Again, these are firsthand accounts of our alumni about their time at Stewart. Um, we have uh, collected the many, many reasons that Stewart uh, students attended Stewart. Um, there's an extremely broad overview of the experiences of the school, and you're going to get to hear about that from our alumni that's on hand. We have a very, very important timeline that is outlined in very, very vid vivid details, um, not only milestones in the advancement of Indian policies for our federal government, but specific um, changes that took place right here on our campus. Most notably in this timeline, we actually have the definition of genocide. We took this um, from the United Nations. As you all know, it's the most respected, highest international court on the planet. And according to the UN, what took place, not just here on the campus that I'm associated with, but all Indian boarding schools, this was genocide. And I know for me as a Paiute woman, as a direct descendant of the Stewart um, Indian boarding school, that word doesn't come easily to me. Um, like a lot of Americans, like a lot of citizens of, of earth, genocide is shocking and it's just unthinkable. As a young person, even a Paiute person growing up in public schools, I always associated genocide, genocide with the Holocaust and the tragedies that the Jewish people in, endured in another part of the world um, as an adult. I've learned how to say genocide and to know that that's exactly what the federal government perpetrated on my relatives. So as you can imagine, there's huge intergenerational trauma because of this forced assimilation. If you can imagine either as a young child or as a parent, even as a grandparent, that the federal government elected officials, the people who stand on the creed for the people, by the people, that they instituted these institutions that were intended to absolutely destroy my culture, my ancestors' culture. So um, talking from my personal perspective, when my beautiful grandmother, who is 95 years old today, when she raised her 10 children, she had no point of reference on how to be a mother. Of course, my 10 aunties and uncles, including my mother, had no reference in how to be a mother. This was or a father, and this was all because they were raised in institutions. So throughout Indian country, our relatives have survived the intergenerational trauma through self-medicating, which often involves alcohol or drug addictions, as well as just very explosive disorders, um, violence tendencies. We believe, and I'm thrilled to hear that your organization has similar thinking. We believe that using our cultural center and museum as a platform to tell the authentic, the firsthand accounts of our people, we are going to provide a platform to begin hard conversations to begin the healing process, which is absolutely vital for our communities to continue to, to flourish. 
In our exhibits, we outlined the daily life that the students encountered, endured at the Stewart Indian School. When the operation began again in 1890, I often describe what took place as boot camp. What my ancestors, including my beautiful 95 year old grandmother, what she encountered at Stewart is much what young Americans encounter when they volunteer to serve in the United States military. Their day is punctuated by bells. They participate in by wearing military uniforms. They march everywhere. Extremely harsh discipline was implemented. Um, my relative's hair was cut. And for Indian people, our hair is like another sense to us. It's very sacred. That in itself was traumatizing. The students were typically taught the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Again, skills to help them live a mainstream American life. In the afternoon, the focus was on trade schools. The students were separated by genders and typically the boys learned vocational training, carpentry, auto mechanics, um, farming, whereas the females learned how to sew and cook and eventually some more secretarial skills. Keep in mind that parents could not visit. There was no such thing as spring break. And so um, it was extremely, extremely harsh. And again, our relatives couldn't speak their traditional languages. They were actually beaten for doing so. As you all know, our country, our, our planet is actually still in the grips of COVID-19. For our indigenous people, this really was just one of many pandemics that our relatives have endured. Um, we uh, had several diseases. Um, the Spanish flu was an epidemic during the boarding school area. There were other um, massive diseases that contributed to the death of thousands of students who were sent to boarding school, mostly because of the unsafe and the unsanitary conditions, the um, poor nutrition, children weren't fed well. So we know at the Seward Indian School, an, un an unknown amount of students died, mostly from illnesses that were contracted during the school, but there were a lot of accidents as, all, as well. So um, these stories, again, authentic voices help our alumni and our families to grapple with this complicated legacy. Despite all the darkness and thankfully because the United States federal government eventually did evolve in its thinking in the way that it interacted with our tribal nations, our students were able to make community. Again, despite the regimented days, despite being um, thousands of miles, hundreds of miles and in instances away from their families, their adults in their lives. Our students were able to connect with others through music, through art, and um, we outline that carefully in one of our exhibits, Making Home. I apologize, got a little ahead of myself. So one of the most um, prolific uh, stereotypes that Indigenous people, Native Americans in this country encounter on a regular basis is this thought that Indian people are relics. None of us survived, that we aren't a part of modern America, and nothing could be further from the truth. I as I introduced myself, serve as the executive director of the Nevada Indian Commission. I was actually appointed by the governor of the state of Nevada to improve the quality of life of all 27 tribal nations, bands, colonies, and 50,000 urban Indians who make Nevada their home. So I am living proof, our alumni are our living proof, we are still here. Clearly our people, our ancestors, it's in our DNA that we are resilient, 
our Native American communities continue to revitalize their languages. We continue with our ceremonies. Sharing these stories is meant to help our families and our communities heal. Your timing um, for this presentation coincides with a massive undertaking um, that's going to take place here on our campus. It was all, it continues to be driven by this spectacular young man that you see on the screen. One of the ways that the Stewart Indian School and Cultural Center is combating this historical trauma is with special events. And Ku Stevens, who is a world-class runner and just an incredibly insightful, thoughtful teenager, he is organizing a remembrance run to honor his great, his great grandfather, Frank Quinn, who actually was a student at, at our boarding school. Um, Mr. Quinn ran away from the campus, went, tried to get back to his traditional um, homelands several times. And the um, Stevens's family believes that this took place when um, Mr. Quinn was only eight years old. And so this young man, um, in reflecting on his own life, his own opportunities, feels strongly that without the perseverance, the in endurance of his great grandfather, he wouldn't be who he is today. So Ku has organized this honorary uh, run, which will take place uh, about this time next month, August 14th. Um, it again gives our alumni, our families, an opportunity to share their stories, to know that they're not alone. Our staff will always continue to support our tribal nations with such events. Um, it is critical that we have accurate and again, firsthand accounts of really what happened at this school. Many of you might know that the United States Secretary of Interior has announced an initiative and an investigation into the long-term trauma of boarding schools and our staff is prepared. We've already taken measures to ensure that we can document the enrollment, the names, the tribal affiliations, and the dates of the students who attended this school. Happy to stand for any questions. Um, we wanted to include not just my um, contact information, but um, the two women who really are on the front lines of this effort. You met Bobby Rader earlier in the presentation and then our amazing curator, Chris Gibbons. She's actually worked for the Nevada Indian Commission going on two decades and it's an absolute wealth of information. So um, I'm going to ask um, our host, Jonathan, is this uh, an appropriate time to take questions and answers, or um, I'm going to defer to you on how we continue. Thank you, Stacey. What a wonderful presentation. And thank you to uh, also to Bobby and Harriet. Um, so I, at this moment, I'm going to have all of our panelists uh, jump back on with their video and sound. And we have a lot of questions here. Uh, so my uh, colleague and our executive director, Cindy Heitzman, will help me moderate these questions. Um, and I'm going to start from the top. First of all, um, as you many of you know, this series is entitled Beyond the Building, and I really appreciated how both groups looked beyond the architecture of their respective sites and really dug into the cultural history and a lot of the longstanding um, uh, memories of pain and, and um, remembrance. And, um, and a lot of these questions sort of deal with those. So I'm going to start with one um, that I'm going to address to both groups, actually. It was originally addressed to Erica, but I think it's just as relevant to mm -hmm. the group from the Stewart Museum. And that question is, have you been able to contact descendants of historic staff members for Filoli? But for the museum, have you uh, worked a lot with um, uh, descendants and former uh, students of the school? And what, what have been your memories and experiences with that? So. First, we'll hear from Erica. Uh, sure. We do, after and during NEST, 
Um, we had some family members come forward, um, but really it was more like they were delighted to share family stories with us. Um, we've had some objects that are shared with us. Uh, we have uh, Toichi Demoto's um, book where he documents um, his work with plants. Um, we have a cookbook um, that's been really great to share with visitors. Um, but I, I would say um, it, it doesn't add as much to the depth of what we can get into uh, in our organization as much as Stacy can probably add for her organization. So as I mentioned in my presentation, the Cultural Center Museum is dedicated. It was built for our alumni, for their families, for our communities. It is a place to heal. It is a place um, physically and spiritually for healing. And um, as a direct descendant, I have the insight into my personal family stories. In addition to my amazing grandmother, I have an auntie who was sent here in the 60s. And I also have an uncle who served two tours of duty in Vietnam and then actually was in charge of the infirmary here. So I feel my family history history is well preserved. It's an absolute honor to meet our alumni, uh, alumni on a regular basis and learn more stories. Um, and with that, I, I want to take this opportunity to ask Miss Harriet Brady to tell a little bit about her history with the school. Everything about Indian Country is complex, including the history of the boarding school. And as I hope that Miss Harriet will tell you, her first hand account, hand account is completely different than my relatives. All right, thank you, Stacy. Bija, ne Harriet Brady mi nania ne koyoi dikara ne Pyramid Lake Junior Senior High School school uh, and so I'm just going to make that introduction real brief because usually I go into my relatives but my name is Harriet Brady I am from the pyramid I am a citizen of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe I um, am also a teacher out at Pyram Pyramid Lake Junior Senior High School and um, you know in regards to the architecture <laughs> I went down to visit um, Phoenix Indian School and, and there's nothing left of it. Um, it's made into a park. And I gotta say, I, I don't know how those students feel. Um, I'm really glad that we still have remnants of Stuart still here because you can actually point at a building and said, hey, you know, there's the, the old band room that I attended. You know, we did this over there and I can look across the way and, um, and remember that there was an auditorium there. I mean, there is an auditorium there that we would go to and see movies every Friday night, as long as we were on good behavior. We had a good citizen pass and um, we could go into town. Um, when I went, it, you know, Stacy is correct. It, it's markedly different experience than when my grandmother went to school here. Um, she, she is or was a Northern Paiute. Her mother was Western Shoshone and um, her dad was um, Northern Paiute from Pyramid Lake. And what my grandmother had told me was that her mother had told her, you need to go to school over there. And she's talking to her in her native tongue and, and telling her, you know, you need to go to school there because otherwise you're just gonna be another, you're, you're gonna be a dumb Indian like me. And so in that there, there was um, a lot of um, self-hate being taught that was passed down. Um, and yet, you know, when I came to school here, there were students who were trilingual. They knew English, they knew their native tongue, and they knew, say, like Spanish if they were from um, Arizona. And so, um, you know, since I've been coming here to volunteer as an alumni, it, it's caused me to, to have a lot of internal reflection because I know for a fact that Stuart just like the other Indian schools was started with the um, thought of kill the Indian, save the man. 
And yet the, the turnaround of that was, is I attended in 1976, 77, and I came here to kind of gain self-identity through being native. And so that part is kind of ironic because you have some students attending as a school of choice, whereas the ones before the predecessors, you know, they, they were forced to come here. And, and um, I was telling one group, you know, that I thought about like my grandma, she was taught how to be a service worker, basically. She was taught how to clean. She was taught how to bake. And um, she was a wonderful cook. And, um, and she, she managed one of the little motels in Reno, Nevada. And um, it made me wonder, you know, because she, she was born around 1915. And so um, I'm not sure when she came here. Um, that's one of my regrets. I didn't ask her enough questions as a, as a teenager, but she, um, you know, was taught those so-called skill, skill sets and that's what she did. And it made me wonder what would have happened to all those people if they were offered more? Because I think about one of the, the videos that Truckee Meadows Community College had put out on the Stewart Boarding School where um, they interviewed this one man named Mr. Ridley and he grew up, you know, he went to school here, but yet he became an Air Force pilot. And so he was a he was in uh, I think the the sixties, and so that's where it started to really branch open to where it was catering to the kids on possibly what they could be rather than what they were making them to be. And so when I think about my experience, you know, I have mixed I have mixed feelings about it, you know, because I do know the background. It's just, again, I, I'm starting to realize more and more like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm part of the last group that came through. Um, now I didn't graduate from the high school. I, I graduated from another Nevada school, but it did give me that experience of looking at um, the curriculum as a 15 year old. And, and I, I did all right here. I was on the honor roll. And um, I remember talking with one of the counselors who, I guess, I don't know if I was coming across uh, a certain way, but he decided to kind of like put me in my place and said, well, you know what, if you were in a public school, you would just be a standard or average student. And, um, and I knew enough to where I just looked at him and I said, you know what, I think that reflects more on your staff in this admin, school administration rather than me. It almost sounds like you're trying to put me down, but yet why aren't you challenging us then? <laughs> if, if, I'm, if I'm, you know, not meeting those, those, um, those expectations of what you're saying, then that's on you, not really me. <laughs> but I know in my um, English class, I know some of the, the kids had trouble reading and, um, that part was kind of sad, but then they did have, you know, at that time, they did have um, a high math class. They had algebra, you know, they had courses like that and they had US government. But um, again, you know, it, it's like I had to really look at um, what was going on, which is why I decided not to come back to the school the second year. I mean, I did, I walked on campus, but I, I kind of, I decided that wasn't my cup of tea. And so I went off to another public school. But, um, but as far as some of the staff, you know, I think there was good staff here. You know, I think of um, Albert Tyler and his wife, Nadine Tyler. She was the English teacher and Albert Tyler was the athletics director and he was, they were very kind. And so I think during my time period, um, you had a chance to make school good. And if you decided, you know, you weren't going to, then, you know, um, hopefully, you um, you found you found a way to have a good support system but there was you know like i said there there were some good support systems here you know i think about um during my time there were a lot of native staff on board they weren't necessarily the teachers but they were in key places where they could provide support like in the dorms the matrons the bus drivers and I think about like say uh, Lauren and Pearl Samaripa, 
um, they, they were good people. And Miss um, Pearl passed away a couple of weeks ago. And um, I think about Bud Hearn, who was like the basketball coach. He was another good person. He's non-native, you know, but he, he really cared about the kids. Enough to where um, one time when my sister was ditching, because I didn't ditch school because I loved it, <laughs> but she ditched and he found out one of the Brady sisters ditched. And he just, I don't know why he assumed it was me because my sister, it was my sister. And uh, he did come after me. He did spank me in the hallway, you know, where he grabbed me and he spanked me and it hurt. But, you know, I asked him what, you know, as I was screaming along, <laughs> it was kind of funny at the time, I was kind of laughing and half kind of crying. You're like, what are you doing that for? And he said, you know, you are not to ditch. And, and I was like, it wasn't me, it was her. And my sister came walking around the corner just then. And then he went chasing after her. So on that point, that was, that was kind of funny, <laughs> kind of good, you know, that he cared enough. But then there were other staff who did get physical with the kids, even, you know, corporal punishment. I remember the principal had a big paddle that had holes in it. And I remember one of the, I think the, during the first week of um, being on campus, I think one of the football players got in trouble. I don't know what he did, but he got sent to the principal's office and I heard that paddle. And when that young man came walking out, you know, he was crying and um, he, he was big enough to where he could have turned on the principal easy, but you know, there was, he knew the authority. And so um, he didn't do anything other than take his licking. But um, I think, I think it all, you know, just like Stacy said, you know, it, it depends on what time period, you know, and what the experience was. Um, I know, even when I was here there, I remember this one girl, her, um, she was crying all week. She was crying the first week of school because she um, missed her family so much. She eventually went home. And it's funny because now she's a comedian. <laughs> I see her on the Native American comedian circuit. And, and I'm kind of tempted to um, ask her, you know, like what, what changed it? Because um, she, she has a really good sense of humor, but to see her sit there and cry two weeks straight, that was heartbreaking. And, um, you know, that, that was, um, I'm not sure if she was with her, you know, like if she had a mother, but again, that, that was another reason why um, I chose to go to Stewart because I was in the care of my grandmother and people didn't ask questions because sometimes we were all in the same boat. So there was no need to ask those personal questions. We just went about, you know, being students and, you know, whether we participated in sports or the academic side, you know, everybody um, was doing something basically. Um, some kids did run away while I was there. They called it going AWOL. And if they got caught, a lot of times they would go off to Carson and then they would get caught, they would get brought back and then they were given chores to do, which was basically cleaning, you know, but, you know, I, I didn't know of anything like what you see um, or hear about in the earlier times, like maybe they were put in the hole, you know, like a prison, but, um, you know, it, it, I think the time that I went, it was more like a high school. It, it was more geared toward that, so. But it was still, you know, kind of sad being away from your families, especially like the Arizona Indians. But then that was kind of like the excitement of seeing them come in or leave because they had all these buses and they would have, you know, sometimes they would have their families with, you know, like the parents on the advisory boards would come up from, from Arizona. But um, even then, um, you didn't know everybody's experience. A lot of times we didn't find out about our individual experiences until we talked as an adult. Um, I had a friend who was from the Tohono O'odham Nation. Um, they're right there near the border of Mexico. And now he manages his tribal um, radio station. And um, he said he hated coming here. And he and him and I would walk around the quad area. We weren't boyfriend and girlfriend. We were just good buddies, but I never knew he didn't like it like that because I guess that was his time. You know, when he was with me, we were just talking and goofing around and, you know, just talking about the day's events, but I didn't know he did not want to be here. And so 
Um, he didn't tell me that until 2015. And, and he also told me some of the stuff that he was doing and I was shocked because I, I never knew. Um, but there were, you know, there, there was a lot of stuff going on, you know, even, even before I got here. Because I remember when I came on campus, I had heard about a girl dying um, of exposure on the football field the year before. And then there was another um, girl who didn't get medical attention. They didn't get her to the hospital quick enough. I, I don't recall what had happened other than she had passed away. And I know mm -hmm. when I got sick, um, some of the matrons were kind of worried because I was running a high fever. And, um, and then again, that's where it was neat because there was native staff there. And I remember there was a young woman who was a matron and she said, you know, if you were my kid, I would take you in right now. I'm going to go home. I'm going to bring back something. Later on, I found out it, it was Indian medicine. It was that Todza. And she made it into a tea and um, it knocked whatever I had out. It knocked my um, um, high fever and everything. So you had people who knew traditional medicines that basically snuck it in to help out the kids. And... Um, you know, Harriet, okay. Harriet, I'm sorry for interrupting. We're running behind schedule. Okay. We have time for one more question. So I would like to, just, um, out of curiosity, I don't remember if it was mentioned before, but what, um, this is my own question. When did the school close? Um, 1980. 1980. Yeah. Oh. Um, so this question is really directed um, for Erica. Um, and it deals with um, any attempts on the, the part of the staff at Filoli to address the legacy of the Bourne and the Matson Roth uh, family's business efforts, especially um, the Roth's involvement in uh, shipping in Hawaii. Sure, I, I actually can't speak in great depth to that. Um, what I can say is that uh, next year um, we plan to tell um, the water story at Filuli and uh, the Bournes, um, William Bourne uh, developed the uh, land around the peninsula and the Bay Area for the purpose of getting as much water as possible to San Francisco. And he also was opposed to Hetch Hetchy, the development of Hetch Hetchy as a resource for water for the Bay Area. And there's just some really interesting narratives around that and um, how he and other wealthy landowners um, developed power, made a lot of money off of this natural resource. And that's one of the stories that we'll be telling next year. We're doing a lot of research into that right now. So it's a really important story to us and into the Bay Area, I think. Um, so that's something that we're going to address. Mm -hmm. um, and just the question about the Roth's involvement with Matson Shipping in Hawaii, is there any attempt to talk about their legacy and their impact on the native population in Hawaii? Sure. You know, it's, it's an interesting question because um, there is certainly a way to look at the, the Matson story with uh, with reverence for creating this industry. Um, they were uh, one of the first companies that brought um, luxury liners to Hawaii and also built hotels there. So they helped build the tourism industry. And the, all, the, the, the other side of that, again, is this, um, this other perspective of how did that affect the native peoples there Mm -hmm. and the people who are there prior to that industry. So it's definitely an interesting question. Um, and again, around the water story, um, there's so many ways that water has been used to develop um, a small number of people, mm -hmm. power and wealth. And that's another mm -hmm. aspect that we can look at. Thank you. Yes, and thank you all to our speakers. I know we weren't able to get all of the questions and I won't be speaking long here because of the change going on in the background. Um, but I wanted to thank our speakers, uh, first of all, and this is a conversation that we want to continue. Um, these are just two sites among many that Erica 
put down and I put into the response um, one about the Museum of Man, which recently was changed uh, to the Museum of Us, uh, which I think is apropos uh, to our times and also very uh, long past due. Um, so, uh, but thank you again for all of your efforts and time to our panel. And uh, we hope you continue uh, to partner with CPF and work with us on other programming. And uh, a special thank you to Erica Schultz for helping organize this as part of our education committee. It's, it's just, it makes our programs richer. Every education committee member brings something new to our programs. And I really was excited about this topic. And remember, we have a second part next week. So we hope you'll join us for uh, part two on next Tuesday. So uh, everybody, I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon.